start, hello everybody. Um, I think, in fact, I'll start with the US and go over some generalisms about US and UK university admissions. Um, the first thing to remember is in the US there are 4,000 universities compared to about 120 in the UK. So I'll keep this as general as possible. What applies to one may well not apply to the other. But for the main purposes, about 650 US universities belong to something called the Common App. And the Common App is a, a system that operates similarly to UCAS. So an application will go to a bunch of universities and then distribute it to the individuals. Um, notable exceptions to the common application are universities like MIT or Georgetown or the University of California system which has a totally different set of expectations and requirements. The second point is that there are absolutely no rankings um, in the US whatsoever. Um, they don't exist. No official rankings. The most popular ones that I'm sure you will look at are things like US World News and Reports, um, Princeton Review, but the criteria that go into ranking US universities I think would be very, very different to the way that you would judge the quality of that institution. Um, for example, the amount of money that an alumni gives back to the university once graduated, um, the number of applications, the volume of applications that the university receives, and the ratio of offers given to students and students enrolling taking up those offers. Very few of which have any effect on the quality of teaching and learning um, there. So be careful when you look into the rankings. Um, the second major point, I think, is that the, the UK admissions are separate in the US to the academic faculty of the university. So in the UK, an application will be read by an academic professor, taking time out of his or her teaching schedule to judge whether a student's application is suitable or aligned to one particular course of study. In the US, the admissions is a separate department, independent of the academic teaching departments and faculties of other university. So the requirements and the components of an application are far more far-reaching, multifaceted, and you can include a lot more data. So as a general introduction, those are some of the process. This talk was about standing out from the crowd, and I think there's never been a time where it's more important to um, understand that academic qualifications are um, a requirement, but they're, they're just not enough if you want um, your child to have the best prospects of getting into the university of their choice. And further, I work, I work in a law firm in it where there's aspirations to succeed in their, in their career and perhaps reach partnership if that's what they want. Again, it's very similar, it's a continuum whereby it's not enough just to be a good lawyer. You have to stand out from the crowd. So if we try and drill down into what that might actually mean in practice, um, we spoke a little bit at the beginning about building a CV from um, a much younger uh, age than, than previously. I think there, there's a lot of truth in that in terms of developing your child's interests um, and passions, but I would hesitate to advocate a tick box kind of exercise. It's not about sporting achievement, tick, piano, tick. Um, and I'd say that from my own experience, um, as a, as a mum of, of children going through and having come out the other side in some ways of, of this process, my biggest, or my, my most important piece of advice I'd say is to really work with your child and collaborate in developing their own passions because I don't know, you know they're probably all at very different stages, but they develop um, a, you know, in their, it's not something that you can force or necessarily even channel. You don't know what to expect. For example, my son has just um, developed a real passion for Mandarin that I could never have um, anticipated um, in a, at a younger age. But I think the important thing I've learned from coaching is that it is a collaborative exercise. It is about as much listening 
to your child and what they want to get out of their school career as much as um, guiding guiding them with what with your your knowledge and your experience. And one thing I want to say is so important is for, for anybody um, embarking on a on an educational or other career is real passion, finding what your passion is because um, when children go for an interview, whether it's in the US or Oxbridge or in, in a career later, it's very much about their presence, their impact, their confidence, how they uh, react to other people, how their personality comes across. And building a CV is all about giving them opportunities to develop, but it's not enough, it's not the end game in itself, because they will have to go far beyond um, ballet grade 8 or whatever it is, in order to really um, develop into their, an, an authentic, the best authentic version of themselves, so that they can come across best um, in, a, in a recruitment process. And I have to say, particularly if they've had advantages, if they've gone to the kind of schools that are exhibiting here, um, in an era where there is more and more contextual recruitment, I recruitment based on uh, a, a real in-depth uh, analysis of what opportunities your child may have had compared to others, they have to show that they not only made the most of those opportunities, but they've developed skills and qualities themselves as a result of exposure to them. That's my perspective. Thank, thank you both. Uh, I hope as you go around the, the schools that you see here today, you will quiz them hard about what they do to help your child, as, as you say, Julie, develop authentically. Do they give them the incentives and the opportunities in the environment where they can turn really into themselves, into what they're capable of? There are all sorts of niches for people in this world. I and mean, a law firm, you may think there's a, an image of a lawyer, but no, they will employ all sorts of different people. But they want them to be real people and strong within themselves in, in doing that. And to find a school which will nurture that and will respond to your own child's particular virtues is one of the great advantages of coming to a, an exhibition like this. You get a chance to, to see a lot of them in the flesh and to see how they respond to questions about children like yours and, and the ambitions that you have for your, for your child. So I hope you will have a very good uh, rattle around and don't be afraid to ask questions. <coughs> they don't know who you are. They won't, it's not like going round a school where they've got you ticked off on a list and they'll say, oh, I don't want Mrs. Lucas, she's going to be a real pain in the ass. Uh, she asks some horrible questions as she went round. They'll forget you here as long as you don't give them your card. They really, won't, they really won't remember who you are, so you can be quite rough with them and, 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 and test to see if they, they, they give you the responses you want. But this whole business of what sort of person you turn into is becoming much more important in education and in life. It isn't anymore just, oh, he went to Eton, tick. Oh, they, went to, they, they got a decent degree from Newcastle, tick. It's what is the person turning out like. Uh, there are all sorts of procedures, doubtless you're putting them in place too, to guard against those sort of automatic biases. Oh, well, we'd like to recruit people like us. Uh, there is a real push towards diversity. And at the root of that, that means they will judge your child on what they are like, not on what they bring with them. That the schools and universities they go to are part of a process of producing what your children will be like, and that's what they'll be judged on, not on the quality of badges that they've they've got as they've gone through school. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think you also need to make a very clear distinction between everything that's involved in applying to a UK university and everything that's involved in applying to a US university, which are, which are very, very different sets of expectations. So whilst that's true, for the UK, the application process is relatively straightforward, it's relatively black and white. There are conditional offers on predicted grades, accompanied by short biographical information and a personal statement, 47 lines, 48 lines, 4,000 characters, where the student has to demonstrate their passion for the subject without ever saying the word passion. And it can be relatively formulaic. Um, you know, we've read some great ones that will stand out. 
but there's not much to it. And if the student gets the grades, they go to that university. The US, because the admissions is separate, and because the ethos behind a US undergraduate degree is still about a liberal arts, multifaceted, multidisciplinary approach to education, there's a lot more data that your children can include in their applications. Yes, the academics are always going to be at the core of any decision. You know, if they're going for the top, the top schools, having said there's no rankings, but if they're going for the most competitive schools, then the academics have to be there. But alongside the academics, there's space to bring in a huge amount of the student's character, at the same time as it's rather important not to ever take the admission decisions personally because the competition levels are so, so extraordinary. When I, was, when I was applying, they were already extraordinary. Now, they're slightly ridiculous. And for the sake of your sanity, when you look at the, the acceptance rates, you can cut those in half. So, you know, Stanford last year had an acceptance rate officially of about 5.5%. If you take into account all of the legacy kids, the development kids, the sports scholarships, which is big business in, in the States, you know, universities with 110,000 spectator stadiums, you can see why they're so keen to have sports scholars there. Um, you can cut those admissions stats in half. So the importance of then aligning an application to the university where the student has the chance to show huge amount about themselves um, needs to be grabbed. And as Julie was saying, that's not necessarily having 12 instruments and three community involvements and two sports is far more a genuine interest in an area which can or cannot be linked to the academic subject of interest. Um, and then the students develop that. The US admissions also contextualize everything. So if, if, if the school from which they're coming has all these opportunities on the plate, then they better seize those opportunities to stand a good chance of getting into the top universities. If it doesn't, and they've gone outside of the school boundaries to, 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 you know, to, to show their own initiative, their own leadership within the areas of interest, that can look very, very strong. What students in the British education system tend to have a hard time doing are these essays. And for the US, there are a number of additional essays. It's not one person's statement, it's not formal day, and it has nothing to do really with the academic area of interest. It's a reflective piece of writing, very different to anything, any academic argument they would have learned through a pre-U, an A-level or GCSE curriculum. It's far more a revelation of one's character, age 17 or 18. Um, and it does go into some quite serious depth. So, yeah. And then just to pick up on that, that point that you make about alignment, I think it's the same in the UK, um, both um, at university level and beyond, because um, it's, to me, I, I do work with people on personal statements, and it's about fit, and although they, are, they can be sort of formulaic, it's incredibly competitive to get into the best universities, and you have to understand that people are reading lots and lots of them. And really, I've found that the most successful personal statements are around fit, it's, it's evidencing why you want to pick a particular course at a particular, particular university, and also why they should pick you. And that sounds very simple, you know, why them, why you? But it's actually quite a skill to really show, demonstrate, really demonstrate that you've thought about that and it's important to you and that you've done something um, to, to prove it. So for example, you know, if your child is particularly passionate about history, um, what they will be looking to see is that you've gone beyond the curriculum, that you've perhaps gone to talks um, that are organised out, you know, externally, that you've, you've made the effort to read around the subject, and that you also have your own opinion on it, because they need to see, again, I come back to this word authenticity, but they need to see something of you. It's not just what you've done, it's what you've learned and become as, as a result of what you've done. So, I don't think we have understanding that most admissions will also understand that a 17 year old or an 18 year old hasn't necessarily decided. Um, and for the UK, that can be a problem. Because you're applying to a course of study, your A level, pre level, your pre U A level choices are some way should be determined on the course of study you plan to apply to without the necessary combination 
you've taken out some of the options for undergraduate degree. Uh, the US doesn't have that belief. They still really focus their core curriculum around the liberal arts approach to education. So you know, even if you decided at 17 I'm going to go off and be an engineer, um, you're still required to do the core, the core curriculum, which usually will be a mixture of a bit of French, a bit of maths, philosophy, history, or science. Um, and it's through the discovery of those classes that students start, start to choose their major area of, of interest. Um, so being undecided at 17 or 18 for the US doesn't necessarily pose any problems. Actually, it can work to a student's advantage. If I'm sitting at university having scheduled 25 new classes for this semester, I'm quite excited by the idea that a student's going to come and start picking different classes from different departments and you know, might, might choose, I don't know, Professor Matthews' modern dance class at the same time as Physics 101. With. So actually applying undeclared to the US doesn't harm any chances. Um, it's a very different mindset to be in. Uh, than the UK, where pretty much you need to have decided age 15, 16, I intend to study this course of study, so reverse engineering, which is the A level, few subjects I'm going to choose um, to do so. I think the other thing, because there's so much involved in the US applications, without trying to scare too much, year 12 is too late to start thinking about it. Um, for the applications to be as strong as they would need to be for the most competitive places. Um, and I would suggest, given that there's also standardized testing involved, there's something called demonstrated interest, which as Julie was saying, can, can be attendance at things like you know, the Royal History Society, lectures if history is the passion. But there's also interaction and dialogue allowed and encouraged by US universities before the student actually applies. What you don't really want the US universities for them to hear about the child's name at the same time as they receive their, the, the application. There should be a long history of questioning, attending webinars, visiting if possible. Um, and so because of all the additional components, I would say you know, the, GCSE, the GCSE years are about the right time to start considering US universities, whereas for the UK, other than subject choices, um, it should be okay in year 12.